Hello, everybody. Very welcome along. This is our second show. Oh, I can hear myself. Now, hopefully that's fixed. Uh, okay, everyone. So last night we were speaking with Tony Brady, his Aaron Brady's father. Aaron was um, jailed for 40 years for the murder of Garda Adrian Donahue, who was shot dead in, on the 25th of January 2013. Aaron was found guilty on the 12th of August 2020. Um, he and his family maintain that he is innocent, that he had nothing to do with the robbery, with the murder. And um, they've maintained that position since his, uh, his, since his imprisonment. Now, his appeal started, his appeal, appeal was in October 2023. And to this day, there is still no judgment, still no word on that appeal. So can everybody hear me okay there, just to be sure? I'm not sure what was happening a minute ago. There was some echo or some feedback there. So hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, the Brady family are still waiting for a result or for a judgment in Aaron's appeal. So that should be happening any day. So I'm going to bring in Tony now again. Just let me know that you can hear me, please. It's fine. Thanks very much, John. Okay. Hello, Tony. How are you? Good evening, Stephen. How are you? Very well, thanks. Um, now, I'll just invite everyone maybe to share this and we can try and get as many eyes and ears on this as possible. Um, and let me, just before we go on, Tony, just for anybody who wasn't tuned in last night, just a very quick recap, a few bullet points I made just before we went on air here, uh, what we discussed last night. So we discussed two areas last night. First of all, it was the car that was stolen. Um, and on the Wednesday, two days before the murder, and that was allegedly uh, moved, used in the murder. And um, so in relation to that topic, we found out last night that there was no, ev there was no evidence at all um, that Aaron had any involvement with the car being stolen in Clarehead. No CCTV fo footage, no forensic evidence, nothing. Um, very little CCTV footage was harvested along the 90 kilometer route that Aaron and his friend Jimmy Flynn had allegedly travelled on that uh, Wednesday night, two days, two nights before the, the robbery and the murder. Only CCTV footage from seven cameras was used. Um, so the question there is, why was there not more footage available? Or was there, in fact, more footage available? Did the Gardaí uh, gain more footage that they didn't use or didn't disclose to the defence? As well as that CCTV footage that was used is absolutely useless in my opinion. And for anyone who tuned in last night, I think would agree with that. And if you haven't, if you didn't see last night's show, maybe tune in after or whatever and have a look at it. It's impossible to make anything out from that CCTV footage. And um, the alleged times didn't seem to make any sense. Sometimes it took a very long time to drive a certain leg of the journey. And then other times, um, other legs of the journey, it was done in impossibly fast speeds. You just couldn't drive it. Uh, as well as that, because of the way that the street light reflected on a car roof, it was said that uh, this had to be Jimmy Flynn's car. But then somewhat, sometime a little bit later, we see another car passing and the exact same distribution of light on the roof. Um, now, before I go on and mention a few bullet points from the murder scene, have I summarised most points there, Tony? Do you think it's anything I've left out in that? No, that's that's a good summary of it. It's uh, yeah, breaks it down nicely. Yeah, that covers all the details. Lovely, and just yeah, happy enough with that. Yeah. Okay. So the murder scene last night we just we, we spoke about uh, at the credit union and lordship. There's no evidence of any kind linking Aaron to the crime scene. That's the first thing. Uh, there's no weapons was ever found or proceedings from the robbery were ever recovered. And um, the credit one credit union worker identified a woman as a driver of the getaway car, and she has been completely forgotten about. Uh, there's no mention of her at all anymore by the by the prosecution. Um, a guard of Joe Ryan, who was travelling with Gardo Dunne, who was shot. Gardo Joe Ryan described the gunman who shot Gardo Dunne as being six foot one in height, and his accomplice beside him there being about five foot seven. Now Aaron Brady is five foot seven, yet he's uh, he, he's gone down for for shooting and killing Gardo Dunne, uh, Gardo Dunne, but he's five seven, and Gardo Ryan described the shooter as six one. So you're talking about like five six inches off there. So if Garda Ryan got his height wrong, let's say, uh, and the gunman was in fact 5'7", same as Aaron, well then his accomplice, being uh, six inches smaller, which he mentioned, 
would have put him at about five foot one. So again, that doesn't make any sense there really. Uh, there was no D DNA evidence, or sorry, there was DNA evidence from an unknown source found in the Garda car that was not matching up uh, Aaron Brady or any of this alleged gang that Aaron was part of. Uh, there were footprints and cigarette butts found at the murder scene as well. Again, no match to Aaron or any of the alleged gang. Um, and another of the credit union workers said that one of the men spoke in a Dublin accent uh, and neither Aaron nor any of the alleged gang, again, have Dublin accents. So, um, Tony, did we get most points in that, do you think? Is I missing yeah, anything? Yeah, I think the most points, uh, a little point, well, it's not a little point, but um, that I missed last night was that there's actually £70,000 in Mary's car, the lady who identified the female driver and the silver car. And... Um, it was seventy thousand euro in whole car, and that car wasn't touched. Mm. And again, it 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 adds an air of mystery as to the uh, the reason for the attack, because obviously, if it was that well, and we were told it was a highly well organised, highly well planned operation, and yet they went away without all the money. They only picked up, I think, four or seven thousand euro um, in Pat's car. But the ran past the vehicle with the vast amount of money in it from the other credit unions on the Cooley Peninsula. And that's my fault. I omitted that last night. And I suppose um, one other point, because uh, we had spoken last night about the blue Passat being stolen in Clowerhead, the only two people who give evidence and actually seen the vehicle clearly was Mary and Pat. Um, Mary said it was a grey or silver car. And... Um, as the raiders ran, uh, Detective Joe Ray and drew his weapon, left the car, left his car, the Avensis, ran out and pointed the gun towards the car as it sped off. And he radioed in to, to, to um, base that a uh, grey car had left the scene of the Northern robbery. So okay. the only two people who actually seen the vehicle are describing it as grey and this whole elaborate the um, storyboard was put together to try and frame Aaron and James Flynn for the theft of a blue Passat 48 hours earlier. So, yeah, I think that's that sort of covers that end of it. Right. Yeah. OK. Um, and, and what color was the car then? Well, I mean, we'll get to it, I suppose. Yeah. Actually, color of the, the car that was burnt out. But we're going to start anyway on on the burn site. So right, yeah. after the after the murder, after the robbery, they drove somewhere and they burnt out the car basically yeah. so you have a you sent me a few slides here yes we should have there we go so this is a, the first slide is going to show us uh, the first initial um interaction with vehicles and sightings immediately after the modern robbery so this first bit is uh, Local people obviously will be aware that Lordship Credit Union heading back in towards the dock. So Lordship Credit Union bottom right heading back in, and there's no disputing the vehicle headed in this direction towards Lordship um, or towards Ballymascanlan and towards the M1 and this roundabout. Now the reason why um, this is interesting, uh, there's two sightings uh, registered at the roundabout. And if we go to the second um, slide, so this is only a minute, or we approximate uh, approximately two minutes after the modern robbery. So the blue arrows are denoting, you can see the blue arrows are leaving the credit union. Now, this is the storyboard created by on Gardashi Akona and the DPP. And they allege that a vehicle, there's no sighting of it can round the first major roundabout. But where I have the arrow pointing north on the L7100, there is a sighting there of an 08D Passat by a gentleman. Uh, the details, the times, the information on that sighting is absolutely ludicrous. And uh, again, it's something that was very badly missed by uh, the legal teams initially. It will not be missed on the next occasion. But that is the storyboard. So the blue lines is the storyboard. So that's heading north towards ourselves here. And um, actually, if the storyboard was true, uh, the vehicle would have continued on along a myriad of small roads, would have had to come out onto the Armagh, Dundalk Armagh Road and actually drive past our 
clubhouse here as I look out. And across from me here is a, a petrol station. And they had CCTV footage that was handed in. And the, the prosecution could not uh, show that a vehicle passed at the relevant time. So again, at the very starting point of the getaway, everything's all right. Everything's all wrong in respect of how the DPP presented the story. Now, if we go back to the roundabout immediately after the more than robbery, you can see the red lines that I, the red arrows I've inserted there. So this is the vehicle leaving the credit union after the more than robbery. And this is an actual sighting. And you can see I've put on the bottom there, there's a little horse and trailer. There's a gentleman, a trainer from down south was leaving Dundalk Racecourse. And he arrived at the roundabout and a Passat came around the roundabout in the wrong direction. So it came round the roundabout anti-clockwise. And uh, so as it came round to meet him, the car turned right and headed down the slip road and headed for Dublin. So does that make sense? So the, it actually now, and we believe the reason for because there was other sightings of a vehicle traveling at high speed coming towards the roundabout, and there was a lane of traffic going towards the roundabout. So this would have forced the car going at high speed out onto the right hand side of the road. And this may have been the reason why the vehicle went round the wrong way around the roundabout at high, high speed and uh, exited the roundabout towards Dublin and not northwards, heading south on the M1. And just a very brief, quick breakdown if we move to the next slide, um, Stephen. So yeah. this is just a, a very brief breakdown of the way we see it. Uh, the robbery at Lordship started at 21.29. It took last about a minute, 58, 59 seconds. Um, and then the car taking a minute and 50 seconds to two minutes to arrive at the roundabout. So that's 21.32. Uh, the last race finished, and we know from the details given to us by the racehorse trainer, he watched the last race and walked. Uh, he had a horse running earlier, and he watched the last race at 21.23. Uh, that's the race finished, 21.23. He walked from the edge of the racetrack back into his Jeep and trailer. Uh, we reckon that took four or five minutes because he had to pick up uh, a kit bag and a leather bag, as he described it. And then he drove to the roundabout and probably three or four minutes to drive to the roundabout. And again, we are seeing that takes us to the roundabout at 2132. Now, the interesting part about this information that this... Um, was hidden from during the course of Aaron's trial. This only arose when more digging and uh, searching was done by the legal teams uh, uh, coming up to James Flynn and Brendan Trainer's trial. And again, it was the 11th hour. And of course, uh, once again, Stephen, we have a serious, serious situation where on Garda Shea Corner, we're unable to bring forward any CCTV footage to confirm that the racehorse trainer, that the time he left the stadium was um, wouldn't have been conducive to him reaching the roundabout at 21.32. So the absence, I think, of the prosecution bringing forward evidence uh, to contradict a possibility uh, speaks volumes. And again, we know a little bit more detail in the background now in respect of time CCTV footage, but it's a very, very vital part of, um, and it shows clearly that very, very important evidence was hidden and subdued and tucked away from Aaron's legal team at the time of Aaron's trial back in 2019 and 2020. Okay, Tony. Uh... Yep. So we're going to move on quickly, right? So this, so from the roundabout, so we're going to move now. So the roundabout is only two minutes from the uh, the Lordship Credit Union at the from the more than robbery. So now we're going to jump thirty three kilometers, and again we have thirty three kilometers with no CCTV footage uh, alleged by the DPP, and. Uh, 
I suppose we could stop the whole story now by saying there's no CCTV footage from across the road where we are living, and there would be no other way to get to the burn site in the Thames, and we'll see the Thames as we move on this evening. So the first um, sighting, after the vehicle leaves the, the, the motor scene, is 33 kilometres and I think over 35 minutes later. And once, I suppose, just to mention, there's been no evidence whatsoever of uh, any of the gang get, gathering together. There has been absolutely no evidence of any site or any place where these five people decamped and went their separate ways. So if it would say if, it was, if, if Aaron was connected in any way to a gang and uh, his friend got out somewhere else and then drove in through Cross Midland, he would be arriving in Cross Midland on CCTV footage at 9.30, 9.40. 9.50. So there's no corroborating evidence. This circumstantial ev evidence here, there can be no inference drawn from it whatsoever to suggest that the CCTV footage we're now going to look at had anything, had anything to do with the modern robbery at Lordship Credit Union. So uh, we move on to the next. So we've moved on 33 kilometres. And now this is a, we're homing in now on the burn site. And uh, the burn site is at point number three. And the CCTV footage we're going to look at it is point number one. It's Cortamlet School. And uh, number two is uh, the actual sighting where the farmer was standing in his yard and seen a vehicle. And number four, I haven't really covered in this, but it's actually another sighting that was hidden also that would suggest that the farmer who, at number two, the vehicle he's seen, actually came from the west rather than the south and if i go into too much detail and it, it becomes very confusing so but it's something we can cover and we will look into again so that orientates uh, the public i hope on what we're going to look at now and if we move on to the next scene so this is more of our wonderful cctv footage that was used to convict our son and that on the top right hand corner at 22.04 is a still from CCTV footage at Cut Hamlet School. And that was turned into a Volkswagen Passat. That's and, right on the very right hand. Right yes, hand. yeah. It, it's That light is actually a part of the school light, but there's, there is a vehicle slightly behind it there. It's just, it's, it's impossible to see. But I think when we left you last night, Stephen, the last slide we left on was the, you'll see the number plate light was clearly visible on the car, the getaway car leaving Lordship Credit Union. Very clearly visible. And on blind analysis, Mr. Waller, and he had to agree when he was questioned about this during the course of James Flynn and uh, Brendan Trainer's trial, that uh, this vehicle we're now looking at at 22.04 is, uh, had no number plate light. Or it was a different make of vehicle which had a number plate light situated possibly lower in the body of the vehicle as it drove past Cartamlet School. The vehicle at 22.06, that is allegedly James Flynn's BMW. And that's as good as that picture gets. Mm. So, you know, there's a team continuing from last night. And uh, if we move on to the next slide, this... I mean, how, how... I don't understand now how they can say that that, that, that is... Really well, I think we, we spoke last night about the BMW, the second source of light. Now, there would appear to be a fog light in, at 22.06. And it it could it it could well could well be, uh, so Garda Kenna, who was an expert in nothing, uh, got away with the narrative. We're looking at twenty two oh six at a dark tone saloon car with two sources of light, and that was the sub -to sum total of the circumstantial evidence. Right. Okay. Brilliant. But this one, this um. Is vitally important here, and it shows the concerted effort by the DPP on Garda Shia Kona and the specialist 
uh, Mr. Waller. Uh, Mr. Waller, in his blind analysis, suggested that the taillights in the vehicle at 2204 were higher than the headlights, which is suggesting, he said, an SUV. But by the time this man came to give evidence against our son, Aaron, he had turned a possible SUV with no number plate light into a Passat. And that is exactly what happened uh, during the course of Aaron's trial. And it showed the willingness of this. Uh, I think we actually, th there was serious, serious questions about his um, qualifications and his ability uh, and um, his uh, 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 the qualifications he had and, and the actual uh, evidence he was given, could it be substantiated by a uh, by his um, work he had done previously, and nothing, he he couldn't uh, prove that he had the right qualifications, and there was a lot of arguments over that, and everyone could see that he was simply uh, spouting the narrative that it was set up, and there's actually a there's a lot more evidence in respect to the CCTV footage where the himself and Garda Kenna, so Mr. Wooler, the expert, and Garda Kenna had conspired to do uh, create a reconstruction uh, simply with the two cars that the suspected were up in Clower Head uh, 48 hours previously. So um, what happened with Mr. Wooler, therefore, he believed this was an SUV. He's had a chat with Garda Kenna and Pat Murray and our uh, senior investigating officer, Mark Phillips. So when they were doing, the, when the reconstruction was being created, they never used an SUV. So this is the this is the what we said the tampering and corruption and um, that went on continually in the presentation of the storyboard by the DPP and on Garda Shiakona. and it was orchestrated as I say by Garda Kenna and it was narrated by uh, Logan Stain, Junior Counsel for the Prosecution. And if and if they did use an FAB, what would the significance have been there, Tony? What, what well, we he would. I I would suggest. Well, the the massive uh, uh, the highlighting point here is that in his blind analysis before, so obviously blind analysis. The on Garda Shiakona, Garda Kenna actually sent some CCTV footage to Mister Waller in the UK. Mister Waller uh, looked at the CCTV. He watched this, I, I presume, on numerous occasions, and his initial thoughts were that the taillights were higher than the uh, headlights, so it would suggest a Jeep or an SUV. So um, yeah. the if, if that, uh, see the red lane that's drawn on the SUV there? If mm. you were to take that in a standard car, like, uh, we we'll say, a Passat, that... Um, lane would be horizontal yeah, okay. yeah? and uh, and actually as, as you look at that at 2204 and 2206 it's it's much clearer in 2206 you can see that they're actually traveling uphill <laughs> so it is very possible that the information when uh, mr wooler looked at the uh, blind analysis and looked at the CCTV footage initially, um, he he would have seen that the lights were higher than the headlights. So the taillights were higher than the headlights, which would be highly unusual going uphill unless it was a Jeep or an SUV and therefore completely and totally ruling out the possibility of it being a Volkswagen Passat, which it ultimately turned out to be be in the storyboard created by the DPP. And how, how did they manage, like if you said um, originally uh, was a uh, Woolery you said thought it was an SUV, how did they, how did they manage to change that? Like what, what reason did they give for all this? Well, he went, went through and there was a number of reconstructions undertaken then. And again, it wasn't using the SUV for some, I can't, I can't really remember how he talked his way out of the SUV but um, the reconstruction, again, we had a serious problem. They would not uh, confirm 
and it was quite obvious that the cameras and uh, the equipment had been changed from 2013 on the night this happened to 2017 or 2018 when the reconstructions were done. So they're actually creating reconstructions with um, different equipment and different cameras. Mm. And uh, they got away with um, very uh, broad strokes, like I said, uh, consistent with, consistent, there's taillights on the back of the car and there's headlights in the front of it. It's consistent with uh, a Passat. And, and they really got away with it. And I, I think there was too much uh, emphasis put on his qualifications and his suitability for giving evidence. And there probably should have been a little bit more um, grilling on how he came about uh, his conclusions. Yeah. But again, yeah, so we've moved on. So the next part of, um, so we looked earlier at the close-up of the, area of the burn site so this is point number two and this is the farmer at point number two that was standing in front of his um in the front of in in his front yard yeah so we've moved up from number one we're after looking at the cctv footage so approximately it's about four four or five minutes up the road we're moving now to point two and this uh gentleman uh he did see a black bmw Again, James Flynn's BMW was sort of a gun barrel grey, but notwithstanding that, at night time, at some time around 10 o'clock, uh, he's saying he's not 100% sure of the time. And I would have to say, if and I have gone into some detail on this, he was much earlier with his time in his initial statements. But uh, Detective Bobby Ogle and Detective Paul Gill, I think it was, got speaking to him. And in subsequent statements, he moved his time to 10 p.m. But notwithstanding that, uh, we if if there's any credence to be given to uh, the previous slide we've seen with the time, the vehicles pass at 10.06. They're saying the BMW passed at 10.06. So we're up to some time around just after 10 past 10, 10, 10 p.m. He sees a car. But... The main problem here, he sees only one vehicle. And he says the BMW, and he knows it's a black BMW. It's very similar to his neighbor's BMW. So no issue with that whatsoever. And the uh, evidence the farmer gave what the, the, was that he heard the car coming from a long distance away, a very loud exhaust. And he was uh, very adamant, and in the course of his all the statements, first, second, and third statement, um, very strong blue lights. I think it was something that was probably more fashionable back 10 or 12 years ago, was the neon lights, bulbs put into headlights. I think they're actually illegal now. They're, they colour your headlights. Yeah, okay. Okay, and... Um, the point is, if you go on to the next uh, slide, James Flynn's car had no blue lights. James, and we, we've seen James Flynn's car on numerous occasions at uh, petrol stations and filling stations. No lights. It is impossible. It cannot have been James Flynn's BMW. Because the farmer was adamant that it had blue lights and there's no reason to... Uh, not believe him he just the man is telling what he's seen and james flynn's bmw had a factory silencer fitted so the simple outcome or inference we can take from the circumstantial evidence put forward here is the inference i think is quite clear it the one vehicle that the farmer seen cannot have been james flynn's bmw and we now know from the CCTV footage, uh, the clip we, I, we seen last night, the um, slide, James Flynn's uh, BMW uh, was in Cross Midland Square at 9.37. So it would be physically impossible for his car to have been driving down in 
uh, Compson's Road down near Newtown Hamilton at the time stated on the storyboard created by the DPP. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so the, the CCTV footage was absolutely rubbish. Rubbish. So here we have uh, an eyewitness yeah. who saw a car passing by, um, but he totally contradicts really the the, the state's position. Yes. Position. Um, he said that it was a very loud car and it had blue lights, whereas the car in question we're talking about had no blue lights and actually yeah. had, as you say, uh, a silencer fitted. And as well as that, the distance it was it was near impossible for him to get to, to that point based yes. on what was seen on CCTV. Well, you've seen that is correct. And another very important point, Stephen, in that 33 kilometres, a little bit of common sense again and human nature has to uh, come into play here. Uh, to cross the border after a serious crime and discharging a firearm at an armed robbery, nobody from this area would drive towards Newtown Hamilton on the main road. It's uh, Newton Hamilton at that time, uh, and still is, very heavily manned, heavily poli- most uh, uh, heavily policed uh, station, a PSNI station in South Armagh. And it would simply, it, it's just, it just would not happen. I think in the majority or any uh, robberies or um, crimes of this nature, the vehicle is burned out, uh, abandoned and burned out within two or three kilometres. To drive 33 kilometres into an isolated area and to set a car on fire, and and it would it would not be unusual for PSNI uh, helicopters to be out at that stage. It'd be just uh, like sending a flare up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the notion that these young men would have done this is absolutely ludicrous. It would never, ever happen. So again, that's just reiterating the uh, what I said earlier. Just simply cannot be James Flynn's car. It's just like this whole Burnside uh, saga and DPP storyboard is absolutely... Um, as take a lane from Judge Hunt's description, it's Alice in Wonderland stuff. It's through the looking glass. And I did put this in. If you just go to the next slide there, this is uh, Garda James Carlin uh, identified James Flynn's car in the square across Midland at 937. And you can see where I've marked the X there and the PSNI sort of on the bottom of the screen. Uh, the cameras uh, looking down into the square, and it actually circles the, uh, the square and cross Midland three times. So the notion, and again, this was hidden, this CCTV footage was hidden from us during the course of Aaron's. But we were aware, we knew that they had it, but we couldn't get it off them for our uh, defence team to have a look at it. Um, it's many- again come up during the trial you weren't able to no do this this didn't come up during the course of Aaron's trial this yeah. again was only uh, available and again at the 11th hour during the course of James Flynn's trial now uh, before we go on just very briefly obviously I mentioned at the start that the appeal uh, Aaron's appeal started in October and you're still waiting for judgment on that appeal to this day you, you managed to in that appeal bring up this issue here, obviously, that what you've talked about here, this slide, the CCTV footage. Yes. Um, and I think, did you say there was 50-odd points that you brought up in that appeal? Appeal, yeah, 54. I think um, 48 points with some of them, uh, with um, like add-ons, A, Bs and Cs. So right. 54 points of appeal. Right. And yes. I think it's worth mentioning... Uh, our national broadcaster, and this is what really, really scares us. Our national broadcaster, RTE, never wrote one line about a seven day appeal. I think it is by far the longest appeal in a criminal appeal, a criminal trial appeal in the history of the Irish state. And not one word or one sentence was written um, in our national broadcaster, RTE. After we absolutely destroyed them with the 
Homeland Security Agent Tape, uh, all the other uh, broadcasters uh, went silent. Mm. And there was very, very little. And I can say without fear of contradiction, Michael O'Higgins uh, just batted out of the park every day. Really he yeah. destroyed them. Really and yeah, yeah and on, on all, and none, none of um, Aaron's appeal, nothing in Aaron's appeal had anything got to do what we've looked at over the last uh, last night and tonight. It's predominantly was legal arguments, predominantly in respect of the American witnesses, which is obviously we're going to get a look at tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you'd wonder really how how they could um, hold up Aaron's conviction based on, on all these points you've raised. Because we've well, it, obviously, and yeah. we just wonder how because what story could they come up with? How could they possibly justify? Yeah. With all this you've put forward, put in front of them, you know? Well, well, this is why we're we are genuinely very scared, Stephen, because uh, I do believe, and we we believe, why where do they go with uh, an unsafe conviction? If if that that's what comes back, o obviously, we really want an acquittal. That's what we want, and but if they come back and say the conviction is unsafe, there's a possibility that. Um, the DPP were going to have to run this story again. And well, like, they would have. Lose me there, Tony. So I think this highlights what we're, we are doing now. And this is why we've continually continued and continued and continued to show this because we want to put pressure on those people who are, if the DPP, the. Solicitor Susan Hudson is sitting watching us tonight. How is she going to take this to the uh, a round table at the DPP and say, yes, we're going to run with this circumstantial evidence again? Mm. Sorry, How, you, you, kind of, you kind of broke up a little bit there when I was just asking you that. So oh. um, you were saying that, that, that they could say the, pro the prosecution uh, is unsafe. Is that what you said? And in which I, case, like, yes. You can rerun the, 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 the whole trial? Or, like, if you can get a what can happen? What other options? Well, he, as far as I know now, because um, a, a lot of a lot of what's got happened and uh, taken place during the course of Aaron's trial uh, is new ground for everyone. But there is a possibility for an acquittal, and Aaron could walk out the door with us. Right. What, what other uh, options? And then uh, they could say that the conviction is unsafe, and it would have to go back to a retrial. And they would right. give the DPP an option of rearresting Aaron and going through all this again. That wouldn't be a smart choice for them because you, you're you're so much more more well prepared. This oh time. yes, yeah, yeah, and there's so much more we have that um, we are to a certain degree keeping a certain amount of our powder dry, and mm. there's a lot of information we have that we're not a hundred percent sure of, but. Um, when the time is right, uh, we will make sure that it's 100% right or 100% wrong, whether we use it or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, will I move on, Tony? Yes, yeah. So this is where the burn site, although already completely ludicrous and ridiculous, this is where it gets uh, crazy. Uh, a second witness was brought to uh, to court, to Aaron's trial, and indeed to James Flynn and Brendan Trainer's trial, and this gentleman seen two vehicles. He, I just put that little silhouette in there. He's a delivery driver, but he was driving his own vehicle. He was driving to collect his kids from U Club at 10.30. So we have anchored this time. And he seen two vehicles at 10.30 at Cortamlet School. Now, we have never seen the CCTV footage of these vehicles at 10.30. That's the first thing. So it's clear indication that the DPP, Lorcan Stain and Brendan Graham are hiding uh, vital evidence because they would have to, uh, I'm sure when they're sitting around the table preparing the prosecution against Aaron, Brendan Graham or Lorcan Stain would have said, well, can we see the CCTV footage of these two vehicles at uh, 10.30? And this gentleman's description, well, one's a, a Bora. Uh, which may look like a little bit like a Passat, but it's actually got an English number plate on it. Mm. And uh, 
the second vehicle he meets we think is a jeep but this is at 10 30. so if we move on to the next slide uh as i said the dpp brought the second witness to court he was going to collect his kids in the youth club so his time is anchored at 10 30. so this is what our judicial system have done they've brought a witness to court to confirm he's seen two vehicles at 10 30 and tried to align this is how corrupt and uh i would say disgusting the word they try to get the witnesses in nice and quickly and if you weren't looking closely you could sort of align the CCTV footage I've shown you, the sighting of the farmer and uh, this um, delivery driver sightings. If you sort of roll them all up together and it's a bit blurry, you can sort of say, oh, same vehicles. Mm -hmm. But when we look into it, what these people actually done, what Locke and Steen and Brendan Grehan actually done and Garrett Kenner, they brought a witness uh, to see you seen a vehicle at 10 30 and they're trying to tell us that that's the same vehicle that was on fire at 10 15. so as judge hunt said it's alice in wonderland stuff right now, so they didn't get away with that obviously that was no they there. didn't no judge now they did bring them to james flynn and brendan trainer's trial it's just it's the arrogance of them, but they, they were fully aware that we had highlighted this even in Aaron's uh, in Aaron's campaign, and I was sort of of the belief that they wouldn't bring the second witness, but they brought him and try. And Judge Hunt did make a flippant remark about, "I don't believe the man at ten thirty. Like, how stupid could any investigative team be?" To bring a man into a courtroom to see seen two vehicles, try and infer. So this is circumstantial evidence. So from this circumstantial evidence, they are trying to uh, raise an inference that that vehicle, those two vehicles this man met, had something to do with the modern robbery at Lordship Credit Union. The times, we'll see the times now in a second, are all absolutely uh, crazy. But the highlight of this, as far as I can see, and it always... Uh, jumped out of me from the very beginning. They're bringing the man into court that seems two vehicles driving up the road when one of them had actually been on fire 15 minutes earlier, six miles further on. <laughs> it's very difficult to comprehend that this actually happened in the Capital Mother case, but this is exactly, and we've put this out on numerous occasions, it's never been contradicted uh, either by um, the Irish state or any of the puppet mainstream media. And the time that the car was was burnt out is, is that accurate or how is there an accurate uh, well if we th there's a whole lot of issues with the car because the problem we have and we'll explain it now once again the farmer seen one bmw the passat could not have got past them because it's a very narrow boring and a number of people i've brought them to see if the second car had to drive past the farmer which obviously must have been the uh, passat it didn't happen. Only one vehicle passed the farmer. Unless the Passat was in the boot of the BMW, uh, the the BMW, the farmer seen a point two was just a BMW belonging to someone else. And we do know, as I show, as we've seen just very briefly on the map, uh, point four, uh, another farmer heard a very loud vehicle around 10 o'clock but he was coming from the west it it physically it, it could not have been uh coming from the from the motor scene yeah and um, maybe you'll you'll come to it in a little while if if that's the case just that that's fine we'll move on but you say that the you know the car was burnt out or on fire at 10 15. yes um, did you mention that already, or will you come to that? How, how I will know? come to that. Yeah, I will come. It's it's the next picture. All right. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this this is the actual vehicle that was burned out, and it is the blue Passat that was stolen. In we know that from the chassis numbers. So it is the blue Passat that was stolen in Claherhead forty eight hours earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, we know well. We don't know. But we were led to believe, and the narrative 
and the story created by the DPP was that the vehicle drove um, from the Mother robbery scene uh, round the roundabout of Ballymac, headed north, didn't pass uh, the garage here. Uh, no CCTV footage for another 33 kilometres till we got to Cortamlet School. We can see how contaminated and incorrect the CCTV footage is that they tried to elude that the vehicles, uh, the vehicle passing at Tamlet School was this vehicle here. Mm. They tried to get away with us, and the reason uh, they brought the delivery driver in, I, as far as I see it, the reason they brought the delivery driver in at 10 30. His savings at 10 30 because he's seen two vehicles. He's seen a Bora and a Jeep, but he's just seen two vehicles. So that created the image in the jury's mind that two vehicles went towards the burn site, albeit uh, 15 or 20 minutes after one of them was already on fire because the farmer had only seen one vehicle at 10 p.m. Yeah. And, and so, was the best farmer like? Sorry if you answered this already there. Um, no, no problem. I know it's very, it's so, it is, it is very confusing. And I know it is difficult to. Yeah. Who, who, who pointed out that this car was on fire at 10.15? Oh, nobody, oh, nobody's seen it on fire at 10.15. I do I, apologize. I, I do know that, yeah. We, we don't, yes, I understand your question. No, and we have, we have serious, serious issues about the time and the burning of this car. The car was found 15 hours later, as you can see, by a park ranger. And the bonnet was still warm and the tires were still smouldering. Now, we were after two days snow. And uh, on Friday, the 29th, or the Friday, the 25th of January 2013, the weather in Newtown Hamilton reached minus one that night uh, at about uh, 12 or 1 a.m. And we have serious, serious doubts that a vehicle doused in petrol. Uh, I've had a brief look at um, some forensic reports and tried to study it. Uh, four to five hours, the fire is gone out. And depending on the area where the fire is setting, the car will start to cool down. And we have right. very... So I'm. we are saying that this car probably wasn't set in fire till 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, that morning. So who's saying 10.15? Oh, the Garda, Garda, that's part of their narrative. They so, said that, that that's amazing, isn't it? That they, they, they actually could put it as specific as ten fifteen, and yet they've brought in but one of the witnesses fit, who, who said they passed them fifteen minutes prior to it being on fire. Like, or yes, sorry, passed them fifteen yes. minutes after it's on fire. Yeah, and um, the the it is it, it's so so confusing. Uh, the reason they are saying it's ten fifteen because the farmer heard a loud BMW with blue lights. Yeah. That's so a, they've that. taken that, yeah. So that's not James Flynn's car. They're con tried to conflate it with the two vehicles a man seen at ten thirty. And in in the midst of just rolling it all up and throwing it up in the air and throwing it out in the ether, Brendan Grehan and uh, Logan Stain were able to create a picture or a narrative that two vehicles went past the school, they went up this road towards the burn site, and a car was burned. So, um, and the farmer, um, does the BMW goes past him from left to right. And again, um, about a half an hour later, he says, and again, we come to the Thames now, the car returns. Now, again, when Bobby, uh, Garda Bobby Ogle and Paul Gill gets talking to him later on in some of his, um, uh, second and third statements, the 30 minutes changes to 20 minutes. But I'm going to stick with the statement that is closest to the event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But even the 20 minutes you will see is uh, is nonsense. So now uh, the whole issue is we've seen the cars coming in at point one. Uh, the CCTV shows us a car 2204-2206. That car travelled up, turned right allegedly this is the story and I'll, I'll just run you through the 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 narrative that the dpp put forward mm -hmm. uh 
Two Fiacons pass, 2204, 2206 pass, point one. Uh, they allegedly travelled up the road. The problem they have with this story that makes no sense, uh, only one vehicle passes the farmer at point one. And they're alleging that uh, somehow the Passat jumped across the farmer at point two and got burned at point three. So if we work out the times from the school to the farmer seeing that this, the car would be on fire sometime around 10, 15. Now, they, they have shown, and the strange thing is they never brought any forensic reports back to give any idea of what time that a forensic expert would suggest the fire, uh, the car was a uh, satellite. They didn't. They didn't, no, but they most certainly did not. But it's mm. something we are looking into, definitely. But the reality, this is what really happened. Uh, two vehicles passed at uh, 2204 and 2206. Um, I'm saying the vehicle that was on and the vehicle that passes the farmer has absolutely nothing got to do with the vehicles that passed the school. They're just people going about their uh, daily business. And it's as simple as that. And then obviously we have the two cars at 10.30 passing point one, which have absolutely nothing got to do with anything. It was brought in as a filler to help create the uh, illusion that the farmer seen two cars at point two, but he most certainly did not. And his yard, he was less than four yards from the road and he was walking in the yard. So he would, he, and he, at night, I've done it several times at night standing in his yard. And even if you walk sort of down towards the sheds and out into a little field, you, you would still hear the second car passing. We've tested all them, as you would still hear. So if you were being alerted by the loud BMW, you would have seen or heard the Passat. It would be impossible for a vehicle nearly to get past him. It'd be like a, he was on sentry duty. And then uh, this exit, as uh, this uh, slide shows here, they never showed us an exit. So if that was James Flynn's car, if it was, and we know it wasn't. It returned past the farmer at two. It came from three, past the farmer at two. This would be their story. Headed back towards Contaminate School at one. Obviously, there would be CCTV footage of the... It would actually be better CCTV footage because it would be on the side of the school. They had no exit. There is no exit from the scene of what they are alleging, the crime of burning the vehicle. They don't even go there. They don't mention it. No, they can't mention it. And because we're going to look at now the times, going any other way would be impossible. And to go back and try and circle around by Newtown Hamilton, it's one of the most secure towns in South Armagh. It's uh, covered in CCTV cameras, uh, PSNI, and um, obviously business cameras. So the no exit, again... This whole burn site is a complete and total farce. It is totally and completely made up. Okay, Every last uh, sentence of it. Yeah. That's what it seems like. Okay, I'm going to keep moving here. because yeah, uh... keep going. Yeah, I know what I'm going on. So run through the times here very quickly. Um, so... Um, so we've seen one, the, this is far more two on the map. He's seen the BMW around 10 p.m. We have to assume if the DPP storyboard is correct and we correlate that with the uh, sightings of 2204 and 2206. So the farmer allegedly see, see, or did see the car 2210. It goes away for 20 to 30 minutes. So that means when the car can pass, back pass the farmer from his right to left, allegedly heading towards Cross Midland, but we know it didn't go towards Cross Midland because there's no exit. Notwithstanding that, it would be impossible for um, because, again, we have times anchored. Aaron was dropped at his girlfriend by James Flynn. Uh, and obviously, we know James Flynn was in the square on Cross Midland. And Aaron was showered, shaved, clothed, changed, and 
he was described by everyone in his girlfriend's house, those four or five people there, as his normal, relaxed, cheeky, chappy self. But again, that's a subjective. What is not subjective, the times of the satings and the anchor time of Aaron arriving in his girlfriend's house in Cullerville and the concession road south of Amar is impossible. Yeah, so tell us what, what, what it would be. So basically Aaron and uh, whoever, this is the this, this prosecution story. They're just after yes. going at the robbery. They're just after murdering the guard. They yes. About 33 kilometres to this place, which is, seems like a very bad place to, to go to burn a car out. There's yes. No fire, obviously, they burnt the car out. So how long would it take? Um, you're saying there wouldn't be possible in what twenty or thirty thirty minutes. Twenty. Well, if if even if the left will will give the the benefit of the doubt, even if there was to the DPP storyboard and say the car can pass the farmer at uh, twenty two thirty. Mm. So a half an hour for Aaron to get back, and he would have to come off that blue lane to go back to his house. Shower, shave, change, and uh, and everyone said he was shower, shaved, and clean because it was a wet, miserable night. So obviously, to tidy yourself up, you would have to go and go through uh, all that to prune yourself up to go to see your girlfriend. And he came into the house as normal, and that's allowing now twenty two thirty. It's still impossible. So, yeah, so I, apart from, like, the time it would have taken him to have the shower, walk into the house, have the shower, say hello to everyone, have a shave, whatever, how long would it be to drive from the burn site back to his house and then Col- also leaving your house and driving to his girlfriend's house? The Cullerville house. I'd, I'd say with the diversion, you probably could do it in 25 minutes, but that when it, obviously you would be rushing. But having a shower, shave, and changing your clothes. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. 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 It's yeah. just where well, you see Aaron would be diverting. You can see what the R182 is written there. Aaron would have to come off there. Or is it further down? I should actually have it marked. He would have, and it would be three or four minutes each way to come off that lane and then come back to Cullerville. So right. it actually could actually, actually add 10 minutes to the journey. Right. Yeah. Okay, Tony. Um, yeah. So I know what. And again, again, obviously, this is the 10.31, uh, the Tamil school. The car wouldn't have been on fire to 10.45. So uh, that's just a complete and utter uh, waste of time. It's nonsense. That's the second Chris, site. That's the extent there of... Uh, there are all the slides you've sent me there, I think. Yeah, that so right? that's it. Yeah, that's that's the one. That's the um, burn site. So that's getting Aaron back into his girlfriend's house in Cullerville. And as we said, he's just his normal, cheeky, chappy self. And that was... So the whole burn site has always been... And we did give a lot of this information at the burn site to Aaron's um, initial legal team. And uh, it wasn't investigated properly. Uh, again, and even during James and Brendan's trial, we had highlighted some of the witnesses coming in. And I'd have to say, you know, just wouldn't be 100% happy with the way it was portrayed and how on Gardashia Corner should have been questioned about, um, well, is that James Flynn's car? The farmer said the blue lights. You know, I would have liked to ask that question because we know Garrett Kenna laid about um, not driving the six minute journey from Monos the Boys to Terma Feck and then the other journey, all the other journey times in um, on the Wednesday night of the scene of the Passat and there could have been just a little bit more uh, sometimes the defence can be passive I suppose that's the best way to describe it and uh, I, I don't think that was uh, conducive, well it wasn't Obviously, because of the convictions we have, uh, Aaron and James Flynn are facing. So, but the whole burn site is, it, it really is a complete farce. Yeah, a couple of comments. By the way, I'll just take this opportunity to mention that if anybody has any questions uh, specific to what we're talking about tonight, the, the burn site, um, and we're going to talk about the fictional gang now, or anything really, 
people want to fire any questions in there and get to them. So let me up, uh, upload this kind of more slides here in relation to the fictional gang that Aaron was part of. Yeah. They carried out this yeah. murder robbery. Yeah. So what can you tell us about this gang? Right. This is, yeah, it, as you can see, we're starting with our mainstream media again. And this... Um, came out in the Sunday world very shortly after the more than robbery at Lordship Credit Union. And uh, you can see quite clearly there, if anyone's looking, if you just tilt your screen away from you, you can see quite clearly that the picture in the middle is Aaron Brady. The Sunday world actually released this picture initially on a social media site without the pixelations. And as you can see from day one, uh, we have a serious, serious problem because we've only four gang members, allegedly. We have a silhouette and um, they don't have the fifth gang member. And for those who weren't watching last night, we are uh, set in stone. Four men jumped across the wall at Lordship Credit Union, attacked the three vehicles and the female was driving the car. And you can actually see there is a picture. Um, the fourth picture there is a, a female. And that was a girl who was mentioned in court. And if we move on to uh, the next slide, this just confirms that right through the investigation, we're into February the 1st here, so the week after. And indeed, there's a lot of information on this on the mainstream media. The Gardaí say a woman driver uh, drove the getaway car for the gang who murdered the detective. So there's no real issue with that Uh and I said last night, and I've watched Mary give her evidence now on two occasions, credit union worker. I've read and I've looked at her statement again on numerous occasions. And um, the female driver of the car, as you rightly said in your summing up of last night's evidence, Stephen, has been uh, eradicated from the evidence because it doesn't suit the na narrative. And uh, they could not link a female to Aaron uh, to say this is the woman that possibly drove the car because she has links to Aaron Brady, she has links to James Flynn or links to Brendan Trainer, both of whom have been acquitted of the robbery and murder at Lodge of Credit Union. And that's not to say that there wasn't a number of uh, pathetic attempts to create a narrative. And if we go on to the next slide, uh, because there is no gang related to Aaron Brady, there had to be one in some way um, attempted by uh, Mr. Grehan. Now, his first attempt was um, uh, naming a young girl in front of the judge and jury. And if uh, he threw her name out in the ether and said it on numerous occasions, and then if you move on to the next slide, uh, Mr. Grehan... Uh, realised that we had found CCTV footage of this young girl in Dundalk uh, and her, as her uh, statement had said, she was getting uh, extensions fixed in her hair or her hairdressers and at the time the Raiders were dropped at the Lordship Credit Union, this is this young girl's car driving through Dundalk. And Grehan Named her on several occasions, but he'd done it very, um, I'm not going to say smartly, it's just disgusting what he was at. Just, you throw names out, and as Aaron always said, when these people ring a bell, you cannot unhear it. But when it became apparent that we had found the CCTV footage, uh, Graham didn't stop at that. If we go on to the next, uh, second attempt was, um, he tried to suggest that it was Aaron's then girlfriend that was driving the car and named her early on in the trial and named her in front of the jury. Uh, and the way he would do it was, uh, well, Aaron's girlfriend uh, has blonde hair. And yes, Aaron, that is that your, that was Aaron's girlfriend. And this is the uh, slay and sneaky way. He was just throwing out names to make a gang. Mm -hmm. Because there was um, there was no link to a female that they could definitely say his third attempt, and probably he he did try this on a number of occasions, and he tried it particularly when he was cross examining Aaron, and this was his um, his third attempt, and definitely his most pathetic. He named um, he was cross examining Aaron, 
And during Aaron's um, interview, he was asked about all his friends and different things, and his friend's name came up. And Graham said, oh, your friend D has a girlfriend. And she had blonde hair. He turned round to the uh, jury. And she had blonde hair at that time. Isn't that right, Mr. Brady? And you could see quite clearly what the bastard was doing. And it was this really, and I was even sick at the time because I know this young girl. And at that time, that young girl was and still is, but um, touch wood, things are very good at the moment. She was uh, battling cancer and she was undergoing chemotherapy. Plus, mm. Graham knew, Graham knew full well that she was sitting in a business in a restaurant in Dundalk. But that is what this man done in front of a judge and jury. That's a picture of and him there. That's him there. And there is no doubt that is the only reason he done. If if Mr. Graham has some other explanation for why he done made these three attempts to create a female driver, if there's some other reason for it, Mr. Graham, would, I, I, I'll apologise if I'm incorrect. But I'm saying you tried to make you were in contempt of court. You are misleading the jury and the judge. Absolutely. And and um, were any of these uh, the three names here? These three women. Did the media name them? Yes. Well, the the were named in uh, obviously a different way. Aaron's girlfriend was named, and Aaron's girlfriend actually came and gave evidence that Aaron arrived in the house at eleven o'clock on the night of the modern robbery. Aaron was fine because there, there was Aaron. Aaron did ask his girlfriend to tell a lay. Uh, where he was because we know Aaron was in the yard uh, laundering diesel, putting cubes of diesel into a, a waste diesel into a lorry. Mm. But when this whole thing escalated, Aaron uh, asked his girlfriend immediately to just uh, tell uh, tell the truth, and he didn't arrive in the house till eleven o'clock. And again, if we look at the just very briefly for those of you, I've covered this on numerous occasions. But it is something we, I should, uh, I don't want to be explaining, but the truth. Um, Aaron, uh, that night, went back to his girlfriend's. Then he went back to his friend James Flynn's house and they were stopped the following morning, Saturday the 26th of January 2013, around midday, by Sergeant John Moroney. And Aaron told Sergeant John Moroney lies. Uh, and if you can imagine... Uh, if Aaron and James Flynn had anything to do with the modern robbery, they actually left Aaron's girlfriend's house, drove through the outer cordon, got out, Aaron got out of the car and moved the cone at Ballymascanon roundabout that we've seen earlier. Mm. They drove up to the inner cordon because that's where James Flynn lived. And again, like the 33 kilometres driving down into uh, a predominantly unionist area in the highest, in a, Haley uh, police, close to a Haley police PSNI station, it just simply wouldn't happen in the real world. Mm -hmm. And they spoke to the members of Angardashi Akona that were at the um, inner cordon. So when they came back out the next morning, now Aaron had all, day, all night to make up a story, an alibi, uh, whatever. Yeah, uh, you know, to get himself out of it, and they actually could have come out of James Flynn's house and went sort of way up by Ravensdale, heading towards I would say Newry, heading more northwards, and they wouldn't have encountered on Gardashia Corner. Mm. And Aaron has always said, uh, Aaron actually said, uh, We'll go the other way, James. And James says, No, we'll go and see what's happening out on the main road. And that was the beginning, and this is one of the reasons we think. The investigation went the way it is. Sergeant John Maroney stopped Aaron. Uh, Aaron told him lies. And, but he said Aaron was quite calm and cool. And uh, But uh, jo Sergeant John Maroney had known Aaron from Aaron wrecking the cars and the dogs. So he was on uh, the Garda radar with Sergeant John Maroney. Right. And Aaron just said, if anyone asks you uh, to the girlfriend... Just say I was in your place from about seven. And then as soon as it hit the fan, uh, Aaron told her to go and explain what happened. And again, common sense would say that if Aaron and James Flynn had anything to do with the modern robbery, 
they would not be using Aaron's girlfriend who is in the house with her friend, her sister, her sister's then boyfriend, now husband, her mother, her father, and her friend's father, and her brother. I think there's seven people in the house. So the actual thoughts of using... Uh, so if his alibi was to be any good, he would have had to convince seven other people to, to say that he was in his girlfriend's house at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. yeah, so amazing. and that and that's that's when it went all wrong. And we have all I, I have always blamed and not speak for anyone else. I've always blamed Sergeant John Maroney and Senior Investigating Officer Pat Murray. They got excited about um, Aaron, Aaron Brady telling lies and it just went down a rabbit hole and it took them five or six weeks. I think when we look through the books of evidence and some of the statements and some of the ongoings in Fort Apache Dundalk, you can see a little turn around uh, April time and I think that's when they realised, oh, sugar, we've made a mess of this. We've gone down the wrong We've gone down the wrong rabbit hole. Yeah. So that's just to clear that up. And we have done a number of videos on that. And again, like the same, I saying Aaron ran off to America. Uh, it makes no sense. He wasn't hiding in America, but it makes for good clickbait journalism. He told lies. His girlfriend told lies. But when you look at uh, the depth of those uh, situations, now, if he had been stopped immediately within an hour of the Northern Robbery, you could understand uh, a, some sort of a panic situation. But this is 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 hours later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, that clears that. So this is the three attempts uh, made by Mr. Graham. And this, the next one is just a little... Um, uh, slide I just put together. It's just a web that was created and they can't name any of them. And of course, we now know that's James Flynn up at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. And we now know his vehicle was in the um, Square and Cross Midland at the time of the more than robbery. So, uh, and they never ever had uh, five people. They could name these three people uh, James Flynn, Brendan Trainer, and uh, Aaron Brady. And we'll see why they've done that with the phone evidence as we go on to the next um, slides. Just to but mention, the, there are a couple of questions there that are not uh, completely relevant to what you're talking about just now. So I'll hold off. And we'll oh, that's fine. Yeah. Those at the end, okay? Yep. So thanks so, uh, for those questions. We'll get to them shortly, okay? That's fine. So we move to the next slide. And again, this shows a concerted effort and premeditated effort by Angarda Shiakona to create a gang. So um, Garda Karen Coughlin was assigned to um, presenting some of the information in respect of some of the phone evidence, the downloads from the phone. And we're looking specifically here at uh, Aaron's girlfriend's phone on the night of the Northern Robbery. And um, Garda Kenna was uh, creating the, uh, all the information was being put up on the screens, as you can see around the court. Uh, Locke and Stain, uh, junior counsel for the prosecution, was narrating the evidence. And uh, this was a serious shock to us at the time when this was announced in court. Garda Karen Coughlin said that at 3 a.m., uh, six hours after the more than robbery, uh, Aaron's girlfriend changed a number of details on a phone for these six people and they put their pictures up on the screen there's none of those people they're just uh, google images i put up on the screens and they named aaron and james's friend and said that jessica had changed some of the details of their um information on her phone and everyone was looking among ourselves so what the, what's the, and it it really did look terrible and uh, there was no answer to it at that time. But the following morning, when it was looked into, what Garrett, 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 Garrett Karen Coughlin failed to tell the judge and the court and the jury, 
that uh, the girlfriend's phone had undergone an update during the night at 3 a.m. And there was over 10,000 actions on her phone. And this woman, Garda Karen Coughlin, picked out the six names of Aaron's friends and James's friends and Jesse, uh, Aaron's girlfriend's uh, friends, put them up on the screen and insinuated that she had manually... Ch- That's what everyone in the court took from it. That's what the jury took from it. And she, she, and she knew that it had made... The, did you oh, say 10,000, did you say? Oh, over 10,000. So over. you know when you know when at night when your phone, your iPhone updates, mm. it can do, and then anyone can check it, it can uh, do anything up to... Uh, it did uh, generate 10,000 uh, actions. Right. And she's and she just picked out this. Signal. Yes, she Talked most certainly it. did, in concert That's with Kenna and in concert with Stain. That is unbelievable, Tony. Like I, I knew you were going to say that. I, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I remember that. Um, obviously yeah. from part of your presentation as well. That that is amazing that she got away with being able to say that. Like, we're, we're, like did the judge have anything to say? Because the next day you're telling me now you figured things out. And yes, figures things. But uh, like what happened in with a lot of the evidence uh, and we'll see it in particular with the american uh, stuff tomorrow night um uh, i suppose the best way to say it the, the verdict was predetermined long before we went into the court yeah there, there is no doubt about it because um jo- uh, we were new to all this and all the surroundings around myself and caroline because we are the only ones really allowed in because of the whole COVID thing uh, Aaron's friends and the rest of the girls and whatever couldn't um, come up with us and into the court we were restricted because of the COVID and we weren't aware of it but Judge Michael White should have seen immediately that this is uh, excuse the language This what Karen Coughlin's doing here is a shit show this is perjury this is contempt of court Totally misleading the court altogether. Yes, totally. Like, there could be no other reason for Coughlin to put those pictures up on the screen in the courtroom. Mm-hmm. And so that was another uh, effort to create a fictional gang because from the very outset, and we're going to move on to it now, um, the phone evidence and how that was portrayed. And, of course, um, Mr. Grahan, uh, at the very outset, again, when um, he was given his uh, first introduction to uh, the jury in January 2020, and Lorkenstein picked up on this big time, along with uh, a phone analyst who gave evidence, a uh, Mr. Um, Edward Magui. I'm just going to mention Mr. Magui wasn't available as an analyst during the course of James Flynn and Brendan Trainer's trial. Um, I'm, I'm, we're not sure why they got a new anal- analyst, but it is is—it's not really noteworthy, but a little bit of clickbait journalism. Um, Mr. Magui owns Abbey Shrew Airport in County Longford, where there was, I think, £80 million worth of cocaine um, landing in it. Uh, over the recent years, and that's an ongoing case. Uh, right. Now, the media was very quick to tell us, and I, I'm sure the me- our mainstream media may be right. Uh, it's nothing got to do with Mr. Magui, but um, we have seen, and I could do, I could do another hour on some of the information and the analytics that Mr. Magui put forward, and we're going to see some of them now. But if this was. Uh, initiated and orchestrated by Mr. Grehan once again when he stood up in front of the jury and he said, we're going to use phone silence here. And uh, if we just go back to the picture, sorry, um, yeah. Grehan stood up and he said, there's a problem with phone reception because of the mountains, the Cooley Mountains and the water in Carlingford Lock and Dundalk Bay. That is a low, that's lays. That's total contempt of court because Mr. Grehan would have been fully aware there was two very high profile cases that actually use cell site analysis and phone data from the exact same area. 
So he was setting the scene to tell the jury our um, phone data is terrible, but we're going to try and squidge it and squeeze it and see if we can get uh, create a false narrative as they obviously did. And they made a very big thing about this, that uh, the activity of the phones on the night of the Northern robbery. So um, this was uh, printed now. If we move on to the cell sites. So uh, a lot of people, I would say, in the public are fully aware of this. And this is just a little bit of an article. Law can stay in uh, senior counsel. Here, mobile phones belonging to the accused and three other suspects were also inactive during the same period, an hour before and after the murder. With prosecutor Lawkin Staines describing this as an extraordinary, unusual, and unlucky coincidence. So they went into great detail about the phone silence. So we'll explain it here. So if we move on to the next slide, that this is just the heading that the DPP put on there. Again, it's part of the storyboard and the phone activity of Aaron, James, and Brendan. And this is the graph, if you move on, that was a graph like this that was created for the three boys. So obviously we see the activity is the black uh, pillars. And then there's a phone silence from around 8.30 to 10, just after 10.20, going on to 10.30. And the three phones are silent, Arendt, James and Brendan. And this is on the night of the 25th of January 2013. We are told this was highly unusual. Now, Stain did say in that little paragraph that there was three other people. But the other third person whom we believe his phone was silent, uh, I, I just can't be 100% sure. It's another friend of the boys of uh, James and Aaron's, but he was in a chip shop in Castle Blaney and the CCTV footage of that. But I, if they had to get a chance, I think they would have slipped another name in and thrown it out in the ether. So that's what we think he was alluding to when he was giving a speech as regards the, um, and again, if you go to the next, this is just, the, there was a lot of Robin Schiller and co uh, put in active phones, unusual and more the trail. There was um, many, many inches, column inches and uh, social media. The next one again, mobile, mobile silence. Yeah. Another one was just the same. And again, the phone traffic, uh, the jury heard yeah, that was um, phones were silent for this hour. But when the graphs and the phone data was analysed by um, the defence uh, specialist, uh, this is actually the truth of the matter here. If you move on to the next slide, next slide. So um, between the 1st of January and the 28th of January 2013, Aaron's phone was silent approximately, sometimes it was 6.30 to 11.30, but in that same evening break. Now, this, mm. doesn't, this doesn't include silence uh, at, tw at noon, at 8 a.m. in the morning. This is at the same time in the evening. Very, very important to understand that. So the information and the details that was... Um, pontificated uh, very strongly by the mainstream media uh, on the behest of Stain and uh, Graham. So it was actually um, more usual for the phones to be silent because Aaron's phone is silent 14 times from the 1st to 28th of January. So half of the time. between the Half of the time. It, and if we move on to the next one, James's phone is silent 18 times. And if we move on to the next one, Brendan is, I, I'm, I may have Brendan's wrong there. It may be 16 or 17 times, but I, I, I'm just not 100% sure and I hadn't time to check. But just mm -hmm. in case Mr. Graham or Stain want to contradict me or indeed Mr. Ed Magui. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is the original facts and this was verified by on Garda Shia the new analysis, Mr. McPhillips. And uh, James Flynn's defence team asked Mr. McPhillips from Angarda Corner for him to conduct his uh, 
investigations into this and lo and behold he confirmed that this was true now we've the whole issue at this but the main issue again well it's all a main issue there's only three people there is no gang and the two men that was named continuously continuously for months Aaron Brady nearly wasn't mentioned during the course of Aaron's trial it was all James Flynn Brendan Train or Brendan Train or James Flynn and lo and behold those two men have been acquitted mm. So now we have Aaron Brady, who now represents four males and one female, all on his own. There's a question for you there, Tony. Uh, I wonder, did they check BT? Because I pick up UK when in Clara. Yeah, it's... it's it, it, the Again, with the information, uh, the way the phone data and the phone uh, cell site analysis was handed over, uh, shall we say it wasn't easy for the defense analysts to um, actually uh, analyze it. And um, again, they're just tampering with the evidence. And there is the possibility, definitely, and that was the situation with Brendan Trainer because his IP address was active at the time when he should have been correlating and getting the gang together. So that's why Brendan Trainer was acquitted and wasn't and obviously his girlfriend confirmed that he was in the house when she came back from getting her hair done. So we have all these issues that was hidden and um the problem we have here and the reason I suppose just exactly what that um message would cover where we are living even now where we are here would be very, very poor coverage. Where Brendan Traynor was living at that time and where Aaron was living, there's still absolutely no coverage. And the yard where Aaron was working in, and again, on Gardaíshia Kona hid this, where there were questions about it, and it probably wasn't detailed enough, but um, Inspector Mark Phyllis was asked, uh, uh, did you check the coverage at the site where Aaron Brady was? And they did have to admit that they checked the coverage and it was very, very poor. Ne and it neither um, UK or Republic of Ireland coverage. Okay. So, uh, mm. so this is the whole narrative that was used to create a gang and the whole unusual. And it, I can't uh, get across strongly enough how much this was used uh, as a stick to create a false conviction. And what about in the appeal? Did you manage to undo any of that? Did you have questions? Well, well, in the appeal, you see, this was the... Uh, uh, well, funny in Aaron's appeal, no, this wasn't part of Aaron's appeal because uh, it's mostly um, points of law in respect of Aaron's appeal, but this became apparent um, during the course of James and Brendan's trial. Okay. So because... Uh, because of the way the law is, Aaron's legal team would not be allowed to raise this because the way uh, the law would see it is, well, you were given the, the data and the information, you should have raised this back in 2019, 2020. Okay. So that's how that's, that's how to get away with doing, you can't come back with that unless you find something completely new. Right. Okay. Um, and again, we have the situation with the gang, and this was again something that was created. This gentleman was arrested, and at the same time, as Aaron was brought home from America, he went to court, he went to jail for wrecking the cars and the dock. On Gardashi Akona appealed his sentence, uh, got the sentence extended. Uh, don't ask me, Stephen, what the sentence was two to three years. Uh, so he was sentenced in May, came home in May, he was sentenced in May 2017. Mm -hmm. He was released on the ninth, on February, February 2019 and on a Sunday evening. And as he was released from Clover Hill or Wheatfield Prison, as he walked up the car park, uh, he was rearrested for the murder of Detective Gard Adrian Donahue. And that was on the Sunday evening. On the Monday evening in Dundalk, uh, this gentleman here was arrested. And there was, again, 
the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, Brendan Grahan and indeed Logan Steen mentioned on numerous occasions. And I think we would all have to accept that there would have been other people in the background, whether it be logistics or um, in some way helping in the background uh, of, along with the five Raiders. So this brings the gang up to seven, eight, nine. And the reason why this one is very, very interesting is um, he's actually related to James Flynn. But at that time, now he's arrested, and I think it says here, um, in connection with the murder, it is understood he is not one of the gang involved in the ambush on Garda Donna. However, a source told the Mirror he is believed to be related to two of the gang members. And the situation is here when this is looked into, and we have gone into a little bit of detail of it, there was a family dispute and family court ongoing at the time. And this gentleman actually wasn't speaking to the other two young men, Aaron's friends at that time. So the possibility of, and he was he was actually named in court and pointed at as being um, this man here, uh, has been pointed at as uh, being part of the logistics. Now he was arrested, and this is on on Monday night. Have we a date here? Uh, Sorry, uh, no, oh, 20, 27th of February. Yeah, yeah. So that's and twenty seventh of February two thousand and eighteen. Is it two thousand and eighteen? Yeah. So we now have six years, and this man's never been questioned again. This man was in court every day during the course of Aaron's trial. This man was in court every day during the course of Brendan and Brendan train on James Flynn's trial, and uh, nobody from Garda Shia Corner uh, approached him or questioned him again because it's an absolute and total load of nonsense, and it's just a smoke smoke screen that was used, and they were allowed to point him out in the courtroom. So it shows, so again, they were trying to give some credence to um, a gang situation, but obviously this man, uh, and there is actually, would you believe, um, without, I, I don't want to confuse the whole thing, but this man was actually, as I said, there was a family law ongoing at the time, and this man had actually lodged pictures of the site where Aaron was loading the diesel, pictures of the cubes, Pictures of the uh, empty lorry, pictures of the forklift in the court because there was an uh, ongoing uh, dispute, as I say, a family dispute, and there was land and property involved. And obviously these people owned the property where Aaron was at the time of the more than robbery. So in Garda Sheikon actually had pictures in and around the same time as the more than robbery. It's, it's, um, and only... Again, it was searched for, and this man came into the court and told Aaron's legal team, we would never have known, and Garda Shia did not disclose those to Aaron's defence team. Wow. So, um, and then we have the situation again, the gang, the two runaway suspects wanted over the mother, uh, Garda Adrian Donahue, making millions in America. And again, I suppose, um, and initially, there was two brothers, James's brother, James Flynn's brother, was sort of named at the beginning. But we then found CCTV footage of this young man in a local shop uh, next door to the more than robbery, uh, getting phone credit. He got into his vehicle. There's CCTV footage of him going back into his home. There's testimony from his girlfriend that himself and his girlfriend stayed in the house. And there's CCTV footage of him exiting his house at 10 p.m. Mm. And again, uh, all this and these hacks are fully aware of that information. Mm. And yet they were happy to peddle this story. And that's why we've shown it. We're not afraid to hate it. Where are these two brothers? Um, and this young man, James Flynn, is an American citizen and could have, if he wanted to stay in America, they never got him out of America because he's an American citizen. But he wanted to come home uh, with his family. And um, his brother is not an American citizen. He's working on uh, perpetuating a green card. And if the Irish authorities wanted that young man, they could have him here in the morning. Now, we're heading for 
uh, 12 years, well, we're just over 11 years after the Morden robbery. If they thought for one second uh, the other brother had anything to do with the Morden robbery, they'd have had him home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they, they know we have the CCTV footage that proves clearly that he wasn't there. Yeah. So again, and but this gives some credence and tried to raise the numbers of the gang. And then we just run through some of the uh, the bunch of five, the Gardy ID close associates of Aaron Brady who have information. So they know all this and there's a senior crime editor, Stephen Breen. Are these crime editors not asking on Garda Shia Corner? Are they not going into uh, Phoenix Park and saying, why is Aaron Brady the only person convicted of this crime? Mm-hmm. Uh, where is the other gang members? You've told us, you can see here, there's uh, next outside Dundalk Garda station. We will find killers. Not sure what date that's from. Uh, that was just after... Um, uh, the more than robbery, they knew who the killers were, and for the sake of all the families involved, someone is going to have to. Um, again, there's more there. Uh, Inspector Christy Mangan, this is just before he retired. His New Year's resolution was to uh, a stark warning, so it's all uh, it's, it's all just a PR stunt to try and uh keep this going and that's yeah. from Ali Bracken in 2020 uh, surely there has to be some questions asked as to what's happening um, no that's yeah Gardy the term this is uh, the next one again it's just our Garda Commissioner there's actually information on some of the phones the Garda Commissioner we would have been very interested in it um, but she give it to, I think, a charity shop. Would that be right? Would I'm right in saying that? Our Garda Commissioner give away six phones. Oh, <laughs> I never asked, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. So there was some inf- interesting information on that. So again, mm. the, the next one's just uh, ones I left at the end. They're going to travel to the ends of the earth. So the bottom line is there is no gang that can be linked to or attributed to Aaron Brady. Three other men and one woman cannot be linked to Aaron Brady. Mm. And the evidence shows that. And it's not it's not that there's no evidence to show that Aaron Brady uh, committed this horrific crime. There's evidence that he didn't do it. I think that's where uh, the campaign has to be now. Uh, Aaron Brady had nothing to do with the more than robbery at Lordship Credit Union. And the evidence actually shows that. Yeah, that's what it's really looking like to me, and it has done for a while. And to more and more people who are coming familiar with this case, and I've looked at some of the evidence. I don't know if you want to answer this question or address this point here that Adrian Fitzpatrick has mentioned. I brought it up last night. Yeah, uh, we we have had a number of people come to us in respect of uh, the motives and the reasons behind the raid, and. Uh, Funny, it's, it's one of the reasons that uh, people have said very strongly is because the actual vehicle with the money wasn't attacked. So if the prime objective was robbery, but uh, it's something we did waste a little bit of time at and uh, try and find out who actually did commit the more than robbery, Lordship Credit Union. Uh, the person or some of the persons who uh, were involved in the more than robbery may very well be living in London and have a garden centre. Some of them may very well have been in the armed forces and have been working in collusion with other state authorities. But I have, uh, or we have no real interest at the moment uh, in going down any of those. We have enough to do with uh, highlighting and showing the case that Aaron Brady didn't do it. Uh, the onus for finding the people who killed, who shot and murdered Detective Gard Adrian Donahue and brutally took his life, that onus falls with his friends and colleagues in the dog guard station. Yeah. I mean, look, it's it's terrible that that guard was killed in, in the line of duty. 
and it must be difficult, obviously, obviously for his family. But what about even his close friends? Would they yeah, not want just, to? Like maybe his family just can't. Maybe the family just want to do all they can just to believe that the Gardaí, you know, are doing their best and telling the truth and they've got the right man. But like, surely there's some people, some friends of Garda O'Donoghue, uh, Garda O'Donoghue, and they've seen this yeah. evidence that you're presenting. Yeah. Like, why would they not want to? Somebody needs to come out publicly and and yeah. and say that the evidence just does not add up. There's no. nothing. Not only there's no evidence, as you said a second ago, there's a lot of evidence to to uh, suggest that Aaron couldn't have been involved. Couldn't have been involved. Yeah, it's it's something that always concerned us, and we could never understand it. And I don't want to. Um, reduce it to a sporting analogy but when we're playing football if the number five in the opposition team was misbehaving and he was clipping lads and uh, being over aggressive with some of your teammates well it's the number five that has to maybe get a good hard shoulder to you must attack the person who is actually done the crime this is what we can't understand uh, these people know the people who carried Garda Donahue's coffin. No, these people know they have the wrong man in jail. They know the man who shot and murdered the colleague is walking free. The Gardaí know that his colleagues know that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt, we we have no um, issue with that whatsoever. They're saying that, and I think everyone that's watching the campaign and. And it is something very difficult, as you say, for the public to understand and possibly the mantra and the Gardaí are willing. That I watched them purge themselves. Uh, very simple things like what Karen Coughlin stood up and give a presentation, what Gardaí Ken had done. I have no uh, qualms in saying these people would face family and friends and say, well, we know Brady done it and we know this is a wee bit dodgy this way and that, but this is what we know, we know. And that's that's the mantra. I have no doubt about that. Mm, Pat Murray, Pat Murray actually stood up and he was being questioned about some details and he, he got a little bit flustered, Mr. Murray, and he says, I know Aaron Brady was in the Lordship car park. <laughs> and, and no evidence know, required. No, no evidence required. Pat Murray knew it, and um, we'll see some of his handiwork tomorrow night with his interactions with the American witnesses. Yeah, and uh, and his, um, and I would be asking people to watch, read his book or uh, a podcast he created called "Making a Detective" with Sunday World or Sunday the Sun, some of the tabloids editor Stephen Breen. And it's called The Making of a Detective. And uh, there's 12 episodes. 9, 10, 11, and 12 are in relation to the Mother at Lodge of Credit Union. And we have torn it to shreds. And uh, neither Stephen Breen or Pat Murray have come back to us. But we'll look at a bit of that tomorrow night. But I'd just like mentioning those things that anyone that's written about it, all the mainstream uh, journalists have written information. We've gone back at them. We've questioned them. And none of them have really none of none of them have reported us in any way. Yeah. And I if mean, we and I guarantee you if we made one mistake. Oh yeah. You oh yeah. Yeah, they'd be on top of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um Tony, not many questions here. Lots of um well wishes from people. Uh Thank the you. little question I suppose there I'll put to you is from Walter on Twitter, and he's just saying, um how often do you visit Aaron? And, and tell us a little bit about how Aaron's doing, actually, maybe as well. Yeah, yeah, Aaron's good. We're going to have to see him now on Friday. Um, uh, you get either a visit or a Zoom call uh, once a week. And um, sometimes he, the Zoom call, he likes to have the Zoom call with his uh, son and wife. Uh, it's um, So we're restricted to how often we can go. Uh, the wee lad was down on there twice just over the last uh, school break. Um, he's in excellent, excellent condition. He's doing his master's. I've said, I don't like using the word, but he's a model. He is a model prisoner. No issues whatsoever. Uh, he's doing his master's. He's um, helping out in the prison gym. He's in excellent, excellent physical shape. And uh, we hear every day. We have a six-minute call every day. And we get... Uh, Six minutes is detailing uh, what he's done in the gym. So, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, he's been he's been very very strong, and um, they created all sorts of scenarios. And I, I I can say the authorities tried everything in their power to get him onto drugs, er, yeah. particularly early on. Uh, give every opportunity and put him in. He went uh, he went missing for a couple of days. I, th- I don't know whether it was in Wheatfield or Clover Hill because there was late problems with electricity and cells. And he was put in with a character from actually Dundalk who had a full array of drugs available. And, uh, the, and only Aaron is so strong. We couldn't do what we're doing. Mm. Okay. You know, it just it just wouldn't be possible. Only he's so strong. He keeps us going, and he's sort of he's is aware of what's uh, going on out here. He does know about the campaign. We try and keep him up to speed with it. Um, big thank you. A lot of people have written to him four or five hundred letters. Um, we did take a bag of them out there a couple of weeks ago, and because um, Mum wanted to read them and look through them. Thank you to everyone who's contacted him. It's absolutely fantastic. And it means an awful lot. And we've reached the point now where people, I think I mentioned it last night when it happened initially, people were afraid to speak to us and we're well, not afraid, uncomfortable. It's like that uh, terrible bereavement when you meet someone who's had a very, very untimely bereavement in their family. It's a difficult situation. We found ourselves in that type of scenario very early on. And if people seen you coming, they probably would go down the aisle with the washing up liquid in it rather than meeting you down where the biscuits are. So, but people are very, very good now, and our friends, neighbours, and family have been fantastic. And I would like to say a big thank you again to Aaron's in laws. They've been absolutely terror strength um, to us. They've been. And they've kept us going. And thank you to all the people who tap us on the shoulder and ask us how Aaron is. And um, thank you so much. It means an awful lot. It's kept us going over the last... We sort of imagined we would be this far on, probably uh, back at the end of 2022, if we were trying to, when we started. That first night, Stephen, in here in South Dama, I thought we'd be at this stage, 2022, sort of. But it's been difficult. Uh, it's very hard. People are afraid of it. There are people out there who have information and do know uh, very vital little bits of uh, associated information. And hopefully they see that our campaign is proving that Aaron is innocent, had nothing to do with this, and that the little bit nuggets of info they have will be vital going forward. And thank you to everyone. And thank you to all the lovely mess just last night. The girls, Caroline and the girls said, no, there's a lot of mess. So we thank people for those. Very, very, very much appreciated. And they're very, very important to us. Yeah. And just there, you mentioned um, a lot of people have written to Aaron. If anyone's watching the show now and they're thinking they'd like to do that, what do they think? Uh, just Aaron Brady, Sea Wing, Portleash Prison, we'll get him. Okay. Great yeah. stuff. Um, so that's great, Tony. We'll wrap it up now, but just before we do, we're going to be back tomorrow night at eight o'clock. Um, yes, our last show in this kind of little um three part series, and we're going to be talking about the American witnesses in the case, yes. which are you know crucial to Aaron's conviction. Yes, uh, and they're also going to talk about um, these allegations that you are at the Brady family are intimidating witnesses. Um, and yeah. You want to give us a, just a little bit? Is there any any other little bits of info you want to give us about tomorrow? Um, well, we'll show that um, again the pontific pontification of Graham and Co. That these people were brave people who came forward and made statements, and they were good, honest citizens. We have shown, and we will show tomorrow night. They are criminals, uh, drug dealers, and illegal immigrants who told lies to. Um, saved their existence in New York. They should have been deported and an immigration expert, Mr. Kerry Bretz, with 40 years experience in immigration in New York, said, for example, that Daniel Cahill's feet shouldn't have touched the ground. And he has been highlighted as the star witness, the man attributed to uh, the conviction, uh, securing the conviction of our son, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, we'll be able to show uh, how crucial and vital, vital information and details was withheld in respect of all these people. 
and uh, the actions of uh, some people may have read about the liquid gold. It was raised in Aaron's appeal. It was one of the big points. An American agent, uh, Matt Katsky, uh, seconded to the British Embassy in London, was running around Belfast Airport offering inducements and saying uh, green cards and um, immunity from uh, other charges, just give us Brady. And uh, so this is the American agent from uh, the American Embassy in London in Northern Ireland uh, trying to solve a mother case in the Republic of Ireland. So, and Matt Katsky, that agent, has his finger in all the pies in respect of Cahill, Morton, uh, Maguire, Ronan, uh, everyone. Matt Katsky is up to his neck in it. So that's a little brief on uh, that. And we are somewhat concerned with this uh, serious accusation about, well, it's not really a serious accusation. We um, The charge against Aaron is a tendency to pervert the course of justice, an action, a tendency to commit an action that may pervert the course of justice. I'll get that right for you for tomorrow night, obviously. And uh, we have to ask the question, why uh, is the Irish state spending money using uh, res- very uh, expensive resources uh, to bring this conviction or bring this case to court uh, for a man that's already serving 40 years to get another two years to run concurrently. There can be only one reason for it. A shit show to try and create more smoke and mirrors. So um, we'll ask that question. We'll show how it is a farce. And again, I won't have time to go through it all tomorrow night, but we have done a number of videos and we've shown clearly it's not the Brady's who's been intimidating people. Um, the Irish Garda have been intimidating uh, people to give uh, false statements against our son Aaron. Yeah. So that's a little taste of what's to come tomorrow night. Good stuff. And I suppose okay. a good. Uh, I just like to say, yeah. Um, when we moved the DPP story about uh, and like with the bond site tonight, when you move everything around, they don't fit. Hopefully, people will take um, from what this opportunity you've given us, Stephen. Um, people will be able to take from it that no matter what information you sort of take from what we are saying, the truth, everything fits. So if we say something in point in at the clower head, it can even resonate in truth in what we're saying with the American witnesses and the intimidation. So everything falls into place and yeah. um, unlike the narrative created by the prosecution, yeah. blue car stolen, Silver car at the model. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so many dis- uh, discrepancies there. Discrepancies, yeah. So, yeah. thank you so much, Stephen, yeah, t- for this opportunity. It's very, very much appreciated. And Caroline and the girls said, said thank you to yourself and uh, thank you to those watching and for all the kind uh, messages. Thank you very, very, very much. Great stuff. Thanks very much yourself, Tony, for your time and best wishes with everything. But we talk to you tomorrow night, tomorrow night. eight o'clock. Yeah. There you go, folks. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, just five to ten, so just did that, did that on time, just about. Uh, please join us tomorrow if you can at eight o'clock. And it's the most, uh, the American witnesses, uh, as Tony has already mentioned there, the, this, these really did the damage. Um, it's hearsay evidence. And uh, basically, on, on, on one particular witness, uh, it was this man's, you know, Aaron Brady's uh, conviction is based on this man's testimony. And it's lies. Um, and you'll see why tomorrow if you tune in at 8 o'clock. Okay, everyone, take care. We'll see you soon.